typically not assigned non-structural damage when I went. Uh, so I was kind of a wild card because I happened to be in New Zealand anyway, but I was assigned non-structural damage today. I did uh, take some material from other team members, but in fact, uh, 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 there, there was little damage in publicly accessible areas, so it wasn't like Chile where you went to the airport and everything was a mess or the shopping centers or things that you just walked in every day. You didn't really see that, although we were there a little bit late anyway. But there was a lot of anecdotal evidence of uh, typical office damage, but we didn't, never got access, so I don't have any pictures of the classic ceiling falling down and so on. There were a lot of newspaper accounts while we were there, however, and that sort of led me on a systematic review of the newspapers, and I got a lot of stuff, uh, I think, that are interesting. And then lastly, in the universities, Mary's going to talk about this, but there is, uh, Canterbury is a major university, and Lincoln University, that had uh, lab and library damage that Mary will talk about. So the Canterbury Hospital has already been discussed. There was a big isolated building, but there were many other buildings in the, uh, in, the, in the complex, and our team was told, yeah, there was some non-structural damage, but it wasn't all that bad. The newspaper says that there, it runs into millions of dollars, and maybe this is for insurance purposes, not clear, but um, that, that didn't seem to jive with what our team reported. The Westpac office building has been discussed. Um, the newspaper says it's in a repair mode after the quake. It was red tagged, as Fred said, mainly for these falling hazards, but then it was green tagged. But the newspaper basically says that the cosmetic repairs interior will keep the building closed for six months. So that's a little bit more than uh, uh, cosmetic. Whether they're going to replace all the systems inside, it's not clear w what would cause this. Uh, but they may just decide to totally upgrade the interior. This building is 15 or more years old, so they, even though New Zealand has had non-structural provisions a lot, much longer than that, it's, it's possible that their systems were, were vulnerable. The Christchurch City Council, again, uh, we all know about this, but there happened to be a lot of uh, uh, articles in the press because it was a brand new building and only been open for a month and it was closed due to damage for a week, and then even after that, uh, th there was scaffolding around here and there, and there was a lot of issues of, uh, about the building. There's a monumental stair uh, in, the, in the lobby <coughs> that had damage. There's a lot of stair damage, as we noticed in Chile and other places. That's theoretically always going to be the case, but we're starting to see it now in earthquakes that if the stairs are rigidly attached, you, you're going to act like a brace, and there are damage. So they reopened uh, th this building, but there was this scaffolding. And uh, one of our members of our team actually got up to the upper levels where they were actually repairing all of the uh, gypboard damage. So the building moved enough, and there was not enough uh, movement allowed in the uh, gypboard uh, that it was all being re replaced. And uh, Mary Camario told me that for a long time there was a huge dumpsters out in front of this brand new building that was all filled with the debris. So not very good advertisement. So it was a 113 New Zealand dollar council building. It suffered about two and a half million dollars in damage and closed for uh, a week. There were a lot of questions from the public in a newspaper. This is a council building. It's kind of like a city hall. Why? Why was it? Why would it be, have to be closed? Um, and according to other newspaper reports, the building was actually designed as an ordinary building. Uh, in other words, there was no importance factor put on it as a decision. But uh, the fact that the, it was designed as an ordinary building, to me, doesn't really explain why there was so much non-structural damage, because the ordinary or special building would not really affect that that much. There was a lot of uh, food... Uh, uh, supply problems, or there, there, it turned out there wasn't problems, but there were rumors around that there was so much food uh, was lost, particularly in warehouses, that there might be a food shortage and the train was out and all these kind of co combined things, but it turned out not, none of it happened. But there was a lot of damage, of course, in every supermarket. As you can imagine, we've seen this everywhere. But there was one super, supermarket in Kayapoi that uh, will not be reopening for a year, so it's not totally clear what what they're going to do to it, but um, that was a s severe problem. Uh, there was warehouse storage pictures of food being damaged, and I think the thing that started the rumor about the food shortage was there was an entire food distribution center 
the, the racks of which uh, failed. And John Eidinger also mentioned that there was a lot of rack damage. And there's all, other miscellaneous rack damage. Uh, the upper left is a paper storage uh, 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 warehouse and the lower right, I believe, was labeled as a paper storage, although it may have been something else. But the fact of the matter is that, interestingly, uh, uh, the racks, even though New Zealand is very aware of seismic issues in, in this particular case, they were not seeming to pay too much in amount to racks. One thing that has been mentioned, actually, is that Christchurch in the, in the old parlance of California is basically a zone 2 or zone 2B at the most. It's about 0.25G. So Christchurch is not a zone 4. It's not Oakland or San Francisco. So anything they do to URMs is more like Sacramento doing something to URMs. So it's pretty remarkable that, that they have done anything because it really isn't zoned that high. It's really zoned for a large earthquake over 100 kilometers away. Uh, rather than this uh, particular earthquake that occurred. Conclusions are really no surprises. As far as I'm concerned, uh, New Zealand has had standards for seismic resistance of engineered system and actual standards since 1983, and they've had standards for seismic restraint of content since 1994. So it was not non-structural damage, I don't believe, was widespread as it was in Chile. There was some disruption from non-structural damage, but in Non-code complying buildings, I think companies and institutions have to really look at reality and decide how much money they want to spend in, in repairing or retrofitting these systems. If it doesn't affect them much to clean things up, then, then maybe it's not cost effective. However, heavy overhead items, and we've, we saw a very heavy ceiling at Canterbury uh, that, that collapsed, and we've seen these racks that collapsed. So there clearly are non-structural uh, life safety risks. I have not included in non-structural chimneys and parapets. Some people call those non-structural. As far as I'm concerned, those are more structural failures than they are non-structural failures. There was a lot of that as well. So I have another couple of observations I couldn't uh, keep myself from making. Uh, uh, there was a lot of permanent soil deformation has been well covered, but but it, 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 again, it's not a new lesson. I call them realizations because all of a sudden you realize something you knew all the time, but you never really thought about it. The liquefaction, in addition to the immediate damage to structures and infrastructure due to differential settlements, there are permanent ground deformations, like of maybe of the order of two feet or more, and it changed local and storm drainage patterns. Uh, so. Here's a, here's a house which, which was not particularly uh, damaged. They use a lot of brick veneer, and you think it would be very brittle. You saw very little of it cracked except in the lateral uh, spreading areas. But, but you can see the liquefaction around the perimeter because the footing punctured the top clay layer, and it settled. So you know the drainage now goes into the house. So it's not a big deal, except this winter it's going to be a big deal if those people, uh, you know, try to try to live there. How do you repair that? You can't excavate or you're going to excavate your whole yard, and then you have to get out to the street at some point. So there's some issues here. Here's another case where uh, the, the house went down, and there's going to be a water, uh, long-term water issue. The adequacy of the surface storm drainage after the settlement is unknown in many areas. I don't think they've done a complete survey of every, everything, so we, you, are you really going to have to regrade all the streets in order to get the storm drainage to work uh, the way it did? And I'm not talking about just local little bumps and hiccups. That can be graded out. It may very well that the water used to go north now goes south. That's a bigger problem. Um, so I think that's something that they don't really know yet. And gra uh, gravity sewer lines, of course, have been mentioned. Uh, and we can talk about all the repairs that are required, but again, if they lost their grade or they now run the wrong way, that's a lot more difficult problem. They may have to install pumps and so on. And when we were there, uh, all the repairs had been done in this area, and yet every about three blocks there was a line going over this stop bank, you know, into this beautiful river, uh, and, and they were pumping the raw sewage because that's the only place they could get rid of it. <clears throat> I really shoot myself in a but for not taking a picture, but about 10 feet down this river, there's a nice sign that says fisherman's access. <laughs> so it would have been a nice. Uh... The, other, uh, the other issue about permanent ground movement is vertical fault movement. Uh, 
And it, it, this would, of course, we know from past experience, it dries up small streams, creates new ones. It caused a flood by um, uplifting a stream bed. This was, again, documented in the newspaper about new springs have been observed and wells in this uh, farmland, a very flat area. <clears throat> so this is an issue, and I have an example of that. Um, there is a approximate fault trace, and a guy named Paget Milsom has a farm uh, about on that X, and we heard that, uh, that he had excavated a river because the earthquake had caused his land to flood, and we pursued and pursued and pursued, and the day before I left, we finally found someone that introduced us to Mr. Actually, Dr. Milson, because he's actually a heart surgeon, believe it or not, a uh, country gentleman, very nice to us, so he took us, showed us all of this issues. So uh, you can see here, whoops, uh, the end of the, of the uh, clear fault, uh, surface fault rupture, and then the suspicion of the continued fault rupture that was mapped, and you can see the dot where his uh, farm was. <coughs> And here, uh, the, the photos I took previously uh, going along the actual fault rupture up and down are all geocoded here, and you can see this is pretty much a straight line to where a photo was geocoded on his uh, property. Uh, so here is the stream that, uh, that uplifted on the, on the south side down here, <clears throat> and here are geocoded pictures. So it overtopped this uplifted here, and then the, the stream stream overtopped uh, and started to flood, and it was a fairly big stream, and his house was right in the middle of it. You can see on the right there's about 750 meters that he dug out uh, with a digger to get the stream to flow over an eight-day period. Um, here is the stream on the left in the, sort of the original state, and on the right, you can see right next to that tree, there's a depression and a stream flowing into this uh, river. And he said that stream was never there before. As a matter of fact, that tree was out of the water. So this side went down, and the water level, the uh, groundwater level is almost at the surface. So if you get any kind of a depression, it will fill up with water, and then it flows into the river. So that's an absolutely uh, new stream. Here is uh, the pictures that... Dr. Padgett, or Dr. Milson took during the, during the flood. You can see in the low right, there's quite a, uh, quite a current going there. So this is where it overtopped, looking over his field. He happened to have a backhoe rented. I'm sure the, the rental agency is not a happy camper, but it was rented, and he managed to get a, a, a delivery of diesel that morning, and he had a farmhand that knew how to run the digger. So he uh, put it in the river and started digging. He kind of figured out quickly what had happened about where the meter, uh, about the meter of, of motion had occurred. So he started digging downstream. Uh, it took quite a while before he figured out he had uh, overcome the meter of differential settlement. So here's more digging. He carefully followed the uh, stream bed so as to minimize the environmental impact, but you can see uh, he, it, you know, he, he was trying to save his house and his land. <clears throat> he did make one call to the environmental agency because in New Zealand you can't touch a river at all, and he, apparently he got some approvals, but I don't know if anybody has seen, the, has seen exactly what he did. But uh, he, he, he went over this, he had to go over this area three times with the backhoe in order to get the flow established because the first time he managed to stopped the flood, but then this quickly filled up again with debris, and he had to go back and forth three times over eight days. And it now, uh, other than the ugliness on the side, the stream flows uh, nicely. But it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, several things were amazing. To see it is amazing, and then the, what he did is amazing. So the conclusion is, you know, that this ch uh, changed the river, and he's concerned that in the future, next winter, it's going to change the floodplains because he's, he expects certain areas of his property to flood when the river gets high, but now he doesn't know where that's going to happen. And the Selwyn River is very close to him, and that's even a bigger river, and he's very concerned that that is going to flood as well. 
It turns out similar phenomena happened in April in Baja, California. This is a quote from the ERI newsletter that topographic warping of previously flat farmland and damage to irrigation canals due to settlement. Many fields of wheat and hay become submerged due to substance in the high groundwater table. Sound very familiar. And I'm basically saying the potential for this kind of damage we should start adding to our loss studies because we have many areas in California, certainly in the Mid-South around New Madrid where this kind of thing can happen and cause a lot of uh, secondary damage. Lastly, uh, a couple of comments about unreinforced masonry bearing wall construction. Uh, Fred covered it very well. Uh, just some samples of damage. This is a, covers the entire street. Uh, this covers the entire sidewalk. Uh, this covers an entire sidewalk cafe. You know, Christchurch is filled with sidewalk cafes, very pleasant. This one would not have been very pleasant if you happen to be there. Uh, adjacent buildings. Can't see it very well, but the building on the left dumped its load on the monumental masons. So the monumental masons now have a lot of used brick to sell. Uh, and the painted room also got wiped out by a gable, as, uh, as Fred pointed out, very uh, susceptible areas. So these damage patterns that we're seeing here are applicable in the U.S. We keep saying, oh, that's never going to happen here because we don't have that kind of building, we don't have that kind of building. We do have these kind of buildings. Uh, way back in 1981, ABK, the very first thing they did was to check across the country in all these areas, New England, South Carolina, New Madrid, to figure out what kind of URMs we have in this country. <clears throat> and exterior multi-wide unreinforced masonry bearing walls with wood floors and roofs is like A number one. And that's exactly what we have in California. That's exactly what they had in Christchurch. Now maybe the mortar is poor. I understand there may be some dry rot problems, but this damage is is in fact applicable to this country in many areas. Uh, the, the, the level of shaking, 0.2 to 0.25 G with intensity 7 or 8, is fairly small. URMs were about the only building type that was systematically damaged there. At the majority of locations of significant damage, I put 150 plus. The more I think about it, with 160 buildings, over 10% damage, if you include all the gable uh, stones falling down, it's probably more like 200 locations. A severe risk to life safety was created by these falls, but nobody was there because it was 4.30 in the morning. In 1994, uh, Michelle Bruneau confirmed the URM risk, primarily in eastern uh, North America that we all knew, and as, a, as sort of proof, he gave, you know, 37 different uh, reconnaissance reports saying, gee, URMs are dangerous. So uh, I'm going to add your, you can add your own zinger here. Uh, I had a lot of different zingers like, duh, and uh, when are we going to learn, and what part of the danger don't you understand, and all kinds of wonders like that. I'll let you add, you know, make up your own. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem. Thank you.